Hello, welcome to Craig Explain Stuff. I'm Craig, and today I'm going to be talking about cloning. Now, when most people think of cloning, they think about reproductive cloning, where you're creating an entire new organism from the donor organism. There's two other types of cloning. That is molecular cloning and cellular cloning. Now, with molecular cloning, you're trying to reproduce a single DNA strand. And with cellular cloning, you're reproducing a single cell or a cluster of cells. Now, both of those two types of cloning are used for medical research and to make medications. And most people don't find that to be particularly controversial. Because if you make, for example, a small cluster of heart cells, then you can do experiments on that cluster of cells without having to harm an animal or um, risk putting a human at risk by doing animal or human experimentation. You can just experiment on a cluster of cells that you've cloned. And you don't have to biopsy people. You can just make the heart cells in a Petri dish and do your experiments on those. So most people don't have a problem with those two types of cloning. So today we're going to talk about reproductive cloning. Now the word clone was first coined in 1903 by this man, Herbert John Weber. He was a plant pathologist. And cloning in botany has actually uh, been used for centuries. And it's done not through um, microbiology, but through a simple procedure um, using cuttings. You can take a cutting from the donor plant and then you can plant that, replant that cutting in a nutrient-rich soil. And if it gets the proper amount of light and water, um, it'll grow into a plant that is a genetic copy of the donor plant. This is easiest to do with vines and is very common with grapes. Now, the reason why it's so common with grapes is because people who run vineyards don't want the plants to reproduce with seed because then it has two parent plants and the DNA for the new child plant will not be the same as the original plant and will therefore not necessarily be the same variety as the original plant. So a grapevine has been reproduced through cuttings for centuries and in fact in Europe there's um, some grapevine that has been reproduced for wine for literally 2,000 years. Now to put that in perspective, that means that grapes for wine are the exact genetic copies of grapes for wine that was drank by Caesar Augustus. Now that's a really long time to um, continue to propagate the exact same genetic plant. And it's also a little neat that you can drink the same wine that Caesar Augustus drank. But cloning does have a few problems, and I'm going to illustrate that with bananas. This is the Cavendish banana. It is the most popular banana exported out of the tropics. 99% of all bananas exported from the tropics are Cavendish bananas, which means that a lot of my viewers have only ever seen or eaten this particular variety of banana. Now, this banana is actually not that old. It was introduced into the markets in the 1950s. Before that, there was a type of banana called the Gros Michel, which was usually translated in the United States into the Big Mike. Now, the Big Mike is actually a slightly sweeter banana than the Cavendish, and it has a thicker, um, thicker peel and therefore is um, easier to transport. The bananas are less likely to bruise because the peel is thicker. And the reason it was replaced is because of something called Panama disease. Now, Panama disease had been continuously causing shortages in the big bike bananas. In fact, um, there was a novelty song from 1923 called Yes, We Have No Bananas, which is probably based on um, a banana shortage at the time. Now, I'm going to play you a little clip of that song. This is the 1923 version as sung by Irving Kaufman. Yes, we have no bananas. We have no bananas today. Now, bananas.
banana shortages were actually pretty common. And then in the 1950s, the Big Mike banana was almost completely wiped out. And the people who were making the Cavendish bananas pointed out that it grew in the same uh, soil and same locations as the Big Mike, and it did not seem to suffer from Panama disease. So almost the entire banana market got switched to the new banana. Now, the problem that I mentioned before is Panama disease being a disease out in the wild has evolved and there's now a new variant of Panama disease called, P, called uh, TR4. Now TR4 does affect the Cavendish um, banana tree and it was first discovered in Taiwan in 1989, the TR4 variant. It got to Australia by 1997. It had covered all of Asia by 2015. Um, in 2019, it hit Colombia, which immediately declared a state of emergency. And then um, in April of 2021, it was discovered in Peru. Now, the problem with cloning is since it's a clone and doesn't reproduce sexually, there's never any new genetics being brought into the, the um, variety of banana which means it has no disease re resistance. It can't evolve any disease resistance to Panama disease. And there's a very real fear that the Cavendish banana is going to go extinct because the Panama disease has become a banana epidemic. It has, um, it's already throughout Asia. It is now in Central America and moving into South America. And it's very much looks like it's going to completely destroy the Cavendish banana crop. Now, the only way to get the Cavendish banana to get disease resistance is through genetic modification. And genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, have actually been banned throughout a great deal of the world. So... They can't actually do this and still sell the bananas. So there's no way to actually save the Cavendish banana and also still keep it as a commercial crop. So that's, that illustrates a very big problem with cloning. Now, so far I've only talked about plants, and now I'm going to talk about animals. Now, animals actually can clone themselves naturally through parthenogenesis. This is actually very common in insects. This particular insect is uh, a type of stick insect, and this particular stick insect uh, actually um, reproduces primarily through parthenogenesis. Even though it can reproduce sexually, it is not its main uh, means of reproduction. It mostly reproduces exact genetic copies of itself through parthenogenesis. Um, many other animals can do this. Some, um, some types of small fish can do it. A lot of insects can do it. Um, in 2001, they discovered that sharks can do it. Now, um, sharks are a particular of interest because until 2001, no one realized that sharks could do this. So this was actually a pretty big deal. This is a bonnet head shark, and this is the type of shark that actually managed to reproduce asexually. Um, this, the, the particular bonnet head that did it was in captivity. It had never been exposed to a male shark, and then it suddenly gave birth. And since 2001, they've also um, noticed parthenogenesis in the black tip shark and in the zebra shark. Now, it's worth noting that uh, no mammal has ever been observed undergoing parthenogenesis. So although this is a type of cloning that occurs in nature, it doesn't occur in mammals. And so now let's talk about artificial cloning. Artificial cloning is um, done through this process here. Um, you take cell samples from the adult being cloned, 
and it says here skin cells but it actually doesn't have to be skin cells it can um, it we often use skin cells because those are the easiest to get through a biopsy you don't have to be particularly intrusive in order to get skin cells and um, people who clone animals typically don't want to um, hurt or interfere with the animal very much so by using skin cells you um, it's the easiest on the animal and then with the adult female you need to take a an egg removed from them um, from its ovaries and what you do is you um, take the nucleus out of the um, the egg that you remove and then you also take the um, nucleus from the um, cell sample from the adult being cloned and you transfer that nucleus into the unfertilized egg and then you apply a small amount of electricity and hopefully that would cause the um, the new nucleus to fuse with the egg and create a new cell then you place that cell typically in a petri dish with a special type of um, nutrient solution to encourage it to divide and then once enough cells divide it'll develop into an embryo because it is an egg cell and then you can get that um, early stage embryo and you plant it into the uterus of a surrogate mother which then carries it to term and then you have a cloned animal the resulting animal that you get is an exact genetic copy of the um, adult being cloned that you took the cell sample from so it's a little complicated but I hope that this chart and me going over the chart made it easy for you to understand how this works. Now the process of um, removing the nucleus from the, um, from the egg and the nucleus from the adult being cloned cell sample, that's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. And that was first um, discovered and written about by Hilda Mangold in 1923. And she did this with um, a type of salamander. Now, her, um, it's interesting to note that her mentor um, put his name on her, on her work because um, she did this work as part of her PhD dissertation. And it's pretty um, common for the faculty advisor to put their name on the work of the PhD student who um, writes their dissertation. And in 1935, the mentor won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for the work that Hilda Mangold did, which isn't really super fair, but it's nice to be able to give Hilda Mangold credit for the work that she did, even if she was not honored for it back, in the, back at the time. <clears throat> now, somatic cell nuclear transfer is how we do cloning today so we've been doing this since 1923 actually somatic cell nuclear transfer we've been doing since 1923 the first time it was successfully used to clone an animal was actually done by this man John Gurdon who did it in 1958 this isn't a picture of him from 1958 this picture is um, from about 10 years ago he actually um, still is a, on the faculty at the University of Cambridge, and he cloned tadpoles. And um, this is actually a pretty big deal. At the time, they could not reproduce his work, so he went, didn't really actually get credit for being the first person to clone an animal until the 70s, when people were able to finally reproduce his work and validate it and um, confirm that um, John Gurdon's work was valid and correct. So he is given credit for the first cloned animal, and it was a tadpole. Now, after cloning the tadpole, people managed to clone various fish and amphibians, and this didn't really ever make the news much because nobody much cared. At the time, cloning was still basically um, in the realm of science fiction. And that all changed in 1996 when they cloned a sheep. This is Dolly the sheep. This is the first clone of a mammal. 
in the world. Dolly the sheep made big, big news because if you could clone a mammal, that is an obvious step towards cloning humans. And there was a great deal of controversy and ethical debate about whether or not cloning should be permitted. This, um, this um, debate has died down a bit, but um, it was never actually resolved. Uh, most religions don't approve of cloning, but some do. So ethically, it's still up in the air as to whether or not cloning is ethical. Um, five years after Dolly the Sheep was cloned in 2001, they managed to clone cats. And this cat cloning actually is very important for um, a few different reasons. First of all, it was the first time a cat got cloned. The, um, the kitten is named Cece for copycat, and the uh, donor cat is Rainbow. And if you notice, the donor cat, Rainbow, is a calico, but Cece is a tabby cat. And this illustrated a point with cloning that I don't think the general public had considered, and that is, despite having the exact same DNA as, as the parent, that doesn't mean a clone is going to be exactly the same as the parent donor animal. And um, this really illustrated that. And there's a couple of reasons why you're not going to get the um, exact same appearance or the same personality. And one of those reasons is called epigenetic reprogramming. Now, epige now epigenetic reprogramming is a very fancy way of saying that the environment can affect your genetics. And in this case, we're talking about the environment within the uterus as the animals developed. Obviously, CC um, developed in a different uterus of, of the surrogate than Rainbow did because Rainbow was born naturally to a cat. And the differences within the uterus are enough that they can activate or deactivate different um, genes on the um, chromosomes. So although it has the exact same DNA and the exact same chromosomes and even the exact same genes, different genes have been activated in CC that have been activated in Rainbow due to the environment that they were developed in. There's also a second reason why um, a clone might be different from the parent. Most clones are female, and most of the parents are also female. Cloning is usually done with female mammals. And there's something that exists in mammals called X inactivation. Now, a quick refresher of how um, sex is determined in mammals. Um, XX is the um, sex chromosomes for a female, and XY is the sex chromosomes for a male. But um, a mammal only needs one X chromosome, as illustrated by the fact males only have one. So in females, one of the X chromosomes is activated and the other one is inactive, and that's determined at random in utero, which means, and in this case is true, Rainbow had one X chromosome active and one X chromosome inactive, and Cece had the other X chromosome active and the um, other X chromosome inactive. So since they have different chromosomes active, the, there's different genes on those chromosomes which are active. And these genes are the genes that are, the genes that are on the X chromosome are typically the genes that determine appearance. So when you make a clone, since the um, appearance chromosome, the, the appearance genes are on the X chromosome, that means that um, everything about an appearance from skin tone 
to hair color, to eye color, to shape of the face, all of that might be dramatically different from the parent because the clone might have the other X chromosome activated. So the idea from science fiction that um, a clone will be identical to the parent is actually wrong. Clones also won't be identical to one another. Clones are all pr pretty much going to be individuals, just as if um, they were born naturally. So this, the, um, the other thing that this leads us to is um, cloning the cat actually led to an industry of pet cloning. This is Barbara Streisand and her two dogs. Both of these two dogs are clones of Barbara Streisand's previous dog, which died. Now, as the previous dog was dying, um, in her grief, she got, um, she got tissue samples from the previous dog and made clones. And this was an attempt to um, capture the personality of her previous dog. And as I've already explained, this isn't going to happen. The clones are not going to be identical to the parent dog. And in fact, Barbara Streisand has said that these two um, clone dogs have um, different personalities from the original dog and from each other. Um, this actually became fairly controversial because um, animal rights groups think well, there are a ton of dogs in animal shelters. You should not clone a dog. You should just go rescue a dog from a shelter. And um, so this presented an ethical debate as to whether or not animal cloning should be, should be used at all. Now, there's only one company in the United States that does animal cloning. And it actually turns out that it's pretty close to where I am recording these videos. So I actually have some prices for you. Uh, to clone a dog costs $50,000 US. To clone a cat costs $35,000 US. And to clone a horse costs 85,000 US dollars. So this is a pretty expensive technique to get, um, to basically get a dog or a cat because it's not gonna be like your original dog. And I actually, sort of see the point of just go get another dog at the animal shelter. You could save a dog's life and um, save yourself $50,000. But there are um, legitimate reasons to want to clone animals. This is the thylacine, also called the Tasmanian tiger. And this animal is extinct. And one of the reasons this animal is extinct is because of coming into contact with humans. Um, this was a predator animal and humans hunted it. Um, dogs that um, humans brought into its habitat um, killed its prey animals. And humans definitely contributed to the extinction of this animal. This animal was actually already endangered before human explorers found it. But um, humans did contribute to its eventual extinction. Now, we do have tissue samples of thylacines, and there in Australia is a um, very serious attempt to try to clone this animal and bring this animal back from extinction. And I, I know that there's like a whole Jurassic Park scenario of bringing back extinct animals, but in this particular case, these are animals that humans made go extinct accidentally. It's not, it's not animals that went extinct 60 million years ago. This animal went extinct 65 years ago. And there are actual, very real efforts to bring this animal back. Now, another, um, another animal they're considering bringing back from extinction is the dodo. The dodo is another animal that it's well known human contact with um, with its environment led to the extinction of the dodo. 
because of deforestation of the island that the dodo lived on. But now we've talked about um, animal cloning and now comes up the question of human cloning. This is, um, this is a promotional steal from the TV show Orphan Black, which is a show about cloning. And the question is, can we do human cloning? And are we doing human cloning? <clears throat> now, there were claims that humans were being cloned. A, um, a UFO religion named the Raelians actually claimed that um, they cloned a child and named it Eve. They presented absolutely no evidence for this whatsoever, and most people believe that this is a lie because there's absolutely no proof that it's true. They've never shown any um, technical data. They've never shown any science where they did it. They've never produced the supposedly cloned child. So pretty much nobody believes the Raelians. <laughs> Um, there's also a scientist from South Korea who claimed that they cloned a human embryo. And again, he presented no proof, and he was later found um, to be lying and to have committed fraud. And he committed fraud in order to get money, and he got arrested for embezzlement. So, so far, all the claims of human cloning have been discredited. There's another issue with human cloning, and that is primates are actually really hard to clone. The first, um, the first mammal to be cloned, as I already mentioned, was Dolly the sheep. But we had been, they'd been consistently unable to clone any mammals until 2017, when China managed to clone um, a macaque monkey. Now, both of these two um, monkeys in this photo are clones of the original dodo monkey. So the next step to human cloning, since we've managed to clone a primate in 2017, the next step would be to see if we can clone an ape because um, humans are most genetically similar to apes. We're not really that similar to monkeys despite both humans and monkeys being primates. Um, humans are most closely related to apes. And as soon as an ape is successfully cloned, <clears throat> then that means that we have the technology to clone a human. So if we have the technology to clone a human, and that won't be able to stop anyone from cloning a human, then the other, um, the other restriction to human cloning would be laws. So it might be of interest to note that there's not a whole lot of laws preventing human cloning. The nations that are colored in blue are the only nations where human cloning is prohibited. The nations colored in yellow, they have some restrictions on human cloning, but human cloning is allowed if you get around those restrictions. And the nations that are colored in gray do not have any laws whatsoever covering cloning which means that it is de facto legal to clone because they have not made it illegal. Now, I'm going to address the United States because I am from the United States. And the, the restrictions on cloning in the United States are like this. They have repeatedly tried to pass laws in Congress to ban cloning. And none of those laws have ever passed which means that there is no federal law preventing cloning on a nationwide basis. So it's been left to the states. And as far as the states go, only 15 states have laws preventing cloning, which means 35 states in the United States, cloning is legal. So since in most of the world cloning is legal and in most of the world, they're going to have the technology to clone. Then the other thing that might prevent cloning would be the expense. 
a few years back, Forbes magazine actually um, checked the expenses of cloning, and it turns out that according to their calculations, cloning a human would cost approximately $1.7 million. But in their calculations, they assumed cloning would be illegal. So they included um, extra money because they thought that cloning would have to be done um, on the black market in a secret lab. But since, as I've just demonstrated, cloning is not illegal in most of the world, you actually don't have the expense of having to do it in secret. Which means cloning would cost, cloning a human would cost less than $1.7 million. And um, governments, corporations, certain rich people easily have enough money in order to pay for that to happen. So as far as the question of will we be able to clone humans, the answer is pretty much yes. I, I'm not sure we're at that point now, but since we've got primates cloned in 2017, I would estimate it's only about 10 years before the tech um, is there to clone human beings. <clears throat> Now, when Dolly was cloned in 1996, they estimated that it would be approximately 80 years before we had the technology to um, clone a human. <coughs> and it's, um, it's only been 25 years, and the technology to clone a human is literally right around the corner. So then the next question is, perhaps have we cloned a human already? And I'm perhaps in some secret lab by some shady black ops organization. And um, there's plenty of conspiracy theorists who think that we are, are running cloning programs. <clears throat> and by we, I mean somebody somewhere in the world. And I am going to speculate that no, this is not happening. And the reason why I think this is not happening is because you don't have to do it in secret. It's legal in most places. And I think that, for example, China, especially, where it's not illegal and they are actively doing cloning research, I think that their national pride would be happy to let them be the first nation to clone a human being. And I think there are several other places that would be like that. Um, I think anyone who cloned um, who cloned a human would announce it and write a paper on it because it's not illegal. They're not going to suffer any consequences. So that's why I think it hasn't been done yet is simply on the basis of nobody has announced it yet. Um, so I do think cloning a human is probably close. And I think once the technology is there, someone will do it because there's not going to be any repercussions to doing it. So that's been um, Craig Explain Stuff talking about cloning. If you like this video, please hit the like button or please hit and please, please hit the subscribe button. I have other videos on this channel. Um, please go watch them if you'd like. Um, and... Um, this has been Craig for Craig Explained Stuff, and I'll see you next time.